Welcome to everyone on Zoom. Uh, welcome back to another session of, of the workshop in the history of material text. I'm Zach Lesser, English department. I organized the seminar along with Jerry Singerman, Humanities Editor Emeritus at the Press, John Pollock, who is curator in the Kistock Center, and Lila Goldenberg, who is our Bristol Schoenberg Fellow in the History of Material Text. A um, couple quick announcements. Next week, Joseph Howley from Columbia will be here talking about Roman writing equipment, ancient Roman writing equipment. And we accidentally, but pleasantly, follow that up two weeks later on March 18th with Peter Stallybrass, Heather Wolf, and Ray Schreier talking about erasable writing technologies in the Renaissance. So we have two great talks coming up about writing equipment. Um, and in between those two is the ASW Rosenbach Lectures in Bibliography, the, I believe, the longest running series of bibliographical lectures in the United States. Um, On the planet. No, I don't think so, but, but close. Uh, lecture series in bibliography that began in 1931. And this year we have Elizabeth McHenry, um, of NYU and, and a friend of the workshop who presented to us in, in 2021. She'll give three lectures entitled Toward a History of Black Print. These will be on Monday, March 11th. So that's our normal week. Um, also Tuesday, March 12th and Thursday, March 14th. And those all begin at 5.30 p.m., not our normal starting time. So just be aware. And unlike our normal session, you do need to register or I, I don't know, you're asked to register for the Rosenbach? For the Rosenbox through it's the not library required, website. But handy yeah. just for numbers. Nice if you can. And if you want to watch it online, then you get the, the yeah. link through that. Yeah. So yeah. do but do register. Not, not really. Any other announcements? Um Oh, I should announce, she's not here, but I'll announce. I just found out that another friend of the workshop, Whitney Trittine, just officially got tenure. Hey, congratulations. Congratulations. Um, any other pleasant news anyone wants to share? Uh, well, I'm, another bit of pleasant news is that Emma Hart is here joining us. Oh, yes. For the catalog for the dress system. Oh, wonderful. Congratulations. Thank Sean for uh, being willing to submit that. Uh, <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Congratulations. That's great. Um, okay, I have light. You've got the blinding light. All right, now I'm going to turn to the actual introduction. Um, it's great to have Emma Hart joining us. Um, She's been a regular attendee here at the workshop since joining Penn History in 2021, and then taking up her role as director of the McNeil Center a couple months after that. Um, but it's great to have her at the front of the room today instead of, I think, your usual chair is like yes. what you're doing, <laughs> sitting. Um, Emma received her BA from Somerville College, Oxford, and then a PhD from Johns Hopkins before she began teaching at St. Andrews University, which was a return to the city of her birth. So she grew up in Leicester. I don't know what the story is there, but they probably hate each other, Edinburgh and Leicester, I think it's football related. Yeah. 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 Um, but despite all that, she decided to become a historian of early America. And her first book was Building Charleston, as in South Carolina, Town and Society in the, in the 18th Century British Atlantic World, 2010. And her second book was Trading Spaces, which is a very good Philadelphia movie pun. Um, the Colonial Marketplace and the Foundations of American Capitalism 2019. Tonight, I think she's moving a little bit backwards, like in her life, back to the old world, back to <laughs> Scotland, uh, but that's okay, to talk about Tobias Smollett as part of a new biography that she's writing. Okay, but here's the, in, the big thing I learned. Uh, in between her BA and her PhD, Emma had another job. She worked for the Art Loss Register as a stolen art sleuth. I think there's another Philadelphia connection here because I'm picturing her kind of like Nicolas Cage in National Treasure, <laughs> like hunting down Ben Franklin's secret pair of spectacles to decode <laughs> to decode the Declaration of Independence, which sounds like I'm romanticizing this job. And I probably am, except that Emma did participate in a pre-dawn raid on a London safe house 
where she helped discover stolen ceramic cats. <laughs> which is like straight out of a national treasure movie. Uh, also paintings, paintings stashed under beds and jewels that I'm imagining were stolen from the Tower of London. Um, but she's given up that life to take up, to take up the much more thrilling job of director of the McNeil Center for Early American Studies. Uh, and we're very glad she did because we can now welcome her to the workshop to tell us about the Atlantic itinerary of Smollett's complete history of England. So please join me in welcoming her. Right, my slides. Um, well, thank you ever so much for turning out. Um, I hope I can reward you with a, uh, an interesting enough paper here. Um, I'm, 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 of course, stuck on Tobias Smollett, and I will be for the next few years, I should expect. Um, but today, I'm, I'm particularly in, interested in uh, his complete history. Um, and I'd really, I'd just like to thank um, the Material Text crew for putting me on the program, uh, giving me this opportunity to actually write something about Tobias Smollett, to get going on it, um, and for all of the intellectual stimulation since I've, I've been here at Penn. Um, it's a really great seminar and I've really enjoyed uh, listening, and uh, now you get to listen to me. Um, so, um, yeah, talking about Smollett's complete history of England. Um, and I, of course, is an 18th century book, so I need to give you the full title of it. <laughs> the Complete History of England, or uh, the, A Complete History of England from the Descent of Julius Caesar to the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle, 1748, containing the transactions of 1,803 years. Um, that's not even the full title, actually, because on having made it in his history to 1748, he decided to keep going with his continuation of the complete history of England, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So he brought readers in the end uh, almost up to their present in 1762 with these volumes. So um, as touted in the, the description uh, of the talk, and as some of you already know, I'm interested in what is now uh, a somewhat obscure text because it was one of the most successful things that it, or, its author wrote. Uh, and I'm interested in its author and his and his life. Um, I'm sure a lot of you do know uh, Smollett, but for those of you who don't, he was a Scotsman and therefore by definition a Briton who lived between 1721 and 1771. And he was an incredibly successful uh, writer uh, of his time. Um, and I, I'm having to tell some of you about Smollett <laughs> and uh, highlight his continue, highlight his, his history because both of them um, are in relative obscurity these days. Last year, uh, the British historian Jeremy Black, who I don't know if anyone heard of Jeremy Black, yeah, he, he, he writes a lot of books. He's a, he's a yes, yeah, so produces a lot of work and he published a short biography of Smollett last year. Um, this is, you know, a sort of rare event that we get a biography of Smollett. There was one in 2003. Um, but I, I, you know, as, as many other books, he, he kind of uses the imperial context of Smollett, which is what I'm most interested in, to kind of take a cheap shot. Um, he opens his chapter on, on empire and Smollett with a comment about Smollett's marriage to a Jamaican slaveholder being noteworthy mainly because today it would make him fall foul of cancel culture. Um, and history of England gets left on the sidelines by Black as well. It doesn't really get a mention. So Smollett's uh, overlooked uh, stab at writing history um, is overlooked because there were a lot of uh, a lot of what people consider to be more worthy texts around uh, at the time. In this case, the most uh, famous is the inspiration for Smollett's history, David Hume's um, History of England, published um, that that went up took readers up to 1688, and then also another history that was coming out at the same time. Uh, by Catherine Macaulay. Hume's history um, has been subjected to the Liberty Front treatment, so there's editions online and in print, and of course uh, Macaulay, being a woman, also got a lot less airtime for a while. Um, but for Smollett um, and his readers, the history was a big deal, I think bigger than, than both um, Hume's and, and Macaulay's histories at the time. Um, the author maintained that writing 
the the history had cost him his health, no doubt cranking out thousands of words a day in his Chelsea home on the banks of the Thames. He had worked himself to the bone, um, but he was at least rewarded with a bestseller, uh, which outsold Hume and Macaulay um, by many thousands of copies, I think. So I, I want today to make a case for taking tomorrow's history more seriously, um, for, and, and I think uh, that it's worth looking at because of this massive popularity, uh, but also because of its innovative publication history, and also, as you might have guessed from my title, um, its transatlantic reach. And these are three characteristics which I think are intertwined, and I want to explore their interrelationship to, to show how um, the history was a text that, or is a text, that lays bare the all-pervasive influence of empire in contemporary British life. And I, by this I mean not just in the obvious ways, um, ways that of course are in Smollett's text, and the obvious ways being, you know, Britain's naval supremacy, its rising imperial power in the Atlantic and Indian Oceans, and um, the prevalence of patriotism related to the empire in Britain and America. But what I also want to point out is that it's, a, it's an imperial text in the intricate connections and networks that made the book's success possible. The transatlantic nature of this, this success, um, therefore, and the, the British, in other words, English, Scottish and American networks uh, that made the history what it was. Smollett's History of England, uh, despite its parochial title, um, was an Atlantic phenomenon that could only be the product of a deeply intertwined uh, British Atlantic that was in 1763 at its apogee, at its first apogee. Um, so the, the text kind of lays open, and its production lays open the machinery of, of Smollett's embeddedness in, in Britain's Atlantic Empire and uh, the empire's importance to England uh, and Scotland's British Union. And I don't think these are things that you would get from Hume, and the tendency therefore to prioritise him gives the impression of uh, much less imperial influence over, um, over the, the perception of history at this time. But um, at the end of the talk, I also want to focus a little bit on um, the fact that this wasn't a completely happy story of British imperial togetherness. Um, there were already some ghosts in the machine, even at this high point of patriotic unity, and I think we shouldn't ignore them. I'll come to the ghosts um, at the end. So, like all good material text presentations, I have I have some editions of Smiles here in front of me. I have to start with the book itself, um, all the books and pamphlets, actually, because both Smollett's history and its continuation um, were many volumes in length. Uh, as you can see from this advertisement, behind which is um, exerted from the Pennsylvania Gazette uh, behind me, um, May the twelfth, seventeen fifty-seven is the date this appeared. You can see it's dated November seventeen fifty-six. Um, from London, so it took a few months to uh, to get uh, over the ocean. Um, but as you can see from this advertisement, um, it initially appeared uh, as three volumes quarto, bound in board uh, or calf, depending on your budget. You can see it's the complete history there, listed as being three pounds twelve shillings and sixpence, or uh, three pounds three shilling uh, three shillings. Um, so two pounds twelve shillings and sixpence, or three pounds three shillings and naught pence. Um, so it appears in three volumes quarto, a fourth volume appeared in 1758, and by 1762 it had been joined by five volumes of the continuation of the complete history. Uh, Smollett and his publisher James Rivington's chief innovation, however, was to publish the history in weekly installments that could be bound together. And 1758 estimates suggest that it was selling between 10 and 15,000 copies a week in Britain, and an 11 volume reprint in 1759 sold at a rate of 62,000 copies a week. Um, in other words, it was flying off the shelves. Um, we don't have any estimates for how much it was selling in North America, but we do know uh, that it was readily available and easily acquired. Um, it was available because its publisher, James Rivington, would arrive in Philadelphia in late 1760 and then move up to New York, all the while advertising the history for sale. Uh, mind you, David Hall had already offered it in 1759. It was one of the earliest batch of books to be acquired by the library company. Smollett's History in Quarto was listed soon after its publication 
as the 46th item in the library company's catalogue alongside Catherine Macaulay's history. And it, so I think it was likely that it was one of the books that Franklin's friend Peter Collinson had sent across. Um, and it was in the library a good while before Hume's history was. So both in Britain and America, the history would continue um, in popularity for many decades after its publication. Newspaper advertisements suggest a brisk trade in, in secondhand copies at auction until the 1830s. Uh, the history had, um, over the 70 odd years since its publication, become a part of the canon on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, so you can find, for example, uh, an 1808 advertisement in Amherst, uh, New Hampshire's farmer's cabinet highlighting the availability of Smollett's history as a reason to visit the local lending library. Um, in 1828, the New Bedford Gazette entertained its readers with a story about Caribbean shipwrecks from the last century's imperial wars. And Smollett's history was touted as being used to try and locate the wreck that they were searching for, which is it's quite interesting. I, I, that's something I want to follow up. So it was a smash, um, and it was a smash across the Atlantic. The next question is why? And this is where I think the twin issues of publication history and contents need uh, attention. So first, uh, I'd like to propose uh, that it was a smash because of the publication environment in which it appeared. Um, I'm not a professor of English literature, and I'm not going to take this opportunity. I'm looking at Jacob. I'm really sorry. He's <laughs> our English literature fellow at the McNeil Center. I'm not going to take this opportunity to dive into a discussion of genre and relationship between history writing and the novel in 18th century England. I do know that this is a thing. And <laughs> if people here have opinions on how it could be helpful to me, I am, of course, very happy to, to, um, to hear them and would love to hear them back. But I, I think we can learn a lot about the success by exploring the context in which the history appeared. Um, it had a few competitors at the time. Um, as noted in this advertisement, it says that the, the author does not pretend, pretend to have discovered any authentic records um, that would, you know, uh, that justify uh, entering into a crowded field. Um, but but really, it didn't have that many competitors. Um, there was Tyndall's translation of Rapin's history, which is also the, the volume of that on here, which you can see listed um, as also being sold by by Rivington and Fletcher, or published by Rivington and Fletcher. Um, and then there was also these other histories mentioned uh, as well, uh, Guthrie and and Carte. Um, as you can see, they're being touted as being much more expensive than, than the complete history. Um, so uh, Tyndall and Hume, what, what Smollett is coming into is a sort of very evolving field of, of narrative history that Tyndall and Hume are also part of. Um, the author is going sort of beyond a simple list of events to put together a readable story. Though, of course, uh, the, the story is still very focused on national and, and international events. Um, there were also a lot of claims to impartiality in writing these narratives, uh, something, of course, that modern historians would bulk at. Um, but already as established as a, a novelist, a poet, and a pamphlet writer of great popularity, Smollett was very well placed to enter this new and, and new emerging and relatively uncrowded field of writing. He was given a lot of help, though, um, by Rivington. So Rivington <coughs> inherited a printing business um, and used the explosion of secular print in the 18th century to take it in a new direction. And he started off in London. Um, this was not a direction quite often that made him popular. Uh, he pirated books. It was reported in the summer of 1758 that he, quote, went to Scotland and set all the presses are going there with English books. Um, he also undersold competitors in the exportation of books to America. Uh, one competitor, William Strahan, claimed that he had charged, Rivington had charged lower rates to steal customers and then raise them again. So I'm not really sure that I trust the prices listed in that advertisement because that could have been a, um, a sales strategy as much as anything else. <laughs> so Rivington was open to daring and novel strategies as a printer, which obviously advantaged Smollett's um, history in its English market. Um, and the advertising campaign and aforementioned weekly serial printing were clear examples of, you know, Rivington's entrepreneurial spirit. 
Overall, though, it was it was Rivington, Rivington's pairing of these strategies, I think, with his deep interest in the American market that brought the transatlantic payoff that, that really gave Smollett's history it, it, this, this appeal um, in Britain and America. Underselling other booksellers uh, was just the beginning for Rivington, because while I know he's still native England, Rivington made an acquaintance with William Bradford Jr., who was over from Philadelphia in 1741 and struck up a business relation with, relationship with him uh, that was to endure into the 1790s. And it was contacts like uh, Bradford's that enabled Rivington to advertise the history on a transatlantic scale with advertisements such as this one that appeared in the Pennsylvania Gazette and was an obvious, you know, sort of puff, quite accomplished puff for, for Smollett's um, for Smollett's work, uh, taking out. So it, it, it's about um, the whole. The whole ad advertisement is is almost sort of one and a half columns in length. I cut some of the bottom uh, of it off. But Rivington uh, had bigger American ambitions. He bought land in New York, and so when his gambling debt uh, allegedly accumulated through his love of betting on horses, um, um, his alienation of other printers, and his pirating habits. They all conspired to bring about his bankruptcy. He quickly resolved to move to America. And hoping to survive on his wife's £300 a year annuity, he arrived in New York in June of 1760. And then he moved to Philadelphia and opened a bookstore before moving again to Boston um, and, and opening another one in 1762. So all of this means, that, of course, Smollett's publisher of the history was, was perfectly placed to further promote it in the colonies. And it's no surprise that he did he did exactly that, taking out dozens of advertisements um, for Smollett's history and his other works uh, in the newspapers in New York, Philadelphia, Boston, New Hampshire. Um, Rivington lived in New York until his death in 1802, and he was still advertising the history in 1792. Rivington died poor. Uh, I think he couldn't give up on the horses. Um, but no matter his financial situation, his, his life kind of embodies, I think, the interconnectedness of Britain and America at this sort of late 18th century or later 18th century height of empire um, when he went to New York in, in 1760. And for well-to-do men like him, it was, it was easy to move between these two places and take advantage of the additional markets that were opened up for British publishers uh, in North America. So Rivington's talents uh, as, a, as a financially careless uh, transatlantic publishing visionary were important, but I think the quality uh, of the product he was selling was, was also critical. Smollett's oeuvre may today be considered to be of lesser quality and sophistication than his compatriots, like Hume in history, Richardson, Defoe, Stern, Fielding, etc. in literature. But there's no doubt that he had an easy to read style that actually reminds me a little bit of, of Thomas Paine's common sense. You know, it's one of those things that you read and you can really tell that it would have been easier for people to read than some of these other. Um, he was just that, you know, Smollett's history was just that bit more lively and accessible. Um, and you can see he actually uh, claims it, or, it, or it's actually claimed in this advertisement that it has this accessibility. He's saying the, the author has avoided all useless disquisitions, which serve only to swell the size of the volume and interrupt the thread of the narrative and perplex the reader. Um, and it's, it's certainly the case that, that Smollett came through on this. Oh, so there's there's a slide of um, this is the entry in the library company's uh, catalog of Smollett's History of England there next to Macaulay's History at uh, number 45 and number 46 in the acquisitions list. So um, here we have um, a really good example. It wasn't that difficult to find this of uh, of Smollett's sort of brevity and uh, and readability. This is him on the on the marriage of Charles II following his restoration to the English throne. And I'm going to have to read it because it's it's fun. The king's marriage with Catherine, Infanta of Portugal, was celebrated with great magnificence. Though a virtuous princess, she possessed no personal attractions. <laughs> but Charles was captivated by her portion, which amounted to £300,000, together with the fortress of Tangier in Africa and Bombay in the East Indies. Notwithstanding all these supplies, the king dealt out his treasure with such a lavish hand that his coffers were quickly exhausted, and he was obliged to devise extraordinary means to recruit his finances. <laughs> so, <laughs> and there's many examples of this. You can see that I, I sort of think that this version is it's kind of dry as hell, maybe amusing, 
readable and completely to the point. And it's, it's not hard to see, I don't think, how his, an audience would lap it up, um, especially when here's, um, here's Hume on the same subject. I mean, you don't have to read all of it, but come on. I mean, that, that is, is a, a sort of um, level of verbosity, which is next level from, uh, from Smollett. Um, and Hume, you know, of course, may have been more scholarly in his overall narrative, uh, which did, you know, stress in a very uh, intellectually engaging way the emergence of institutions in England uh, that could sustain the government of laws. But I think as academicians, we all know how such subtleties can get lost when it comes to a general reader. And it might be going too far to label Smollett the David McCullough of his time, but I think I think you get the point. You know, he's, he's, he's highly readable. So in addition to being well written, the content of Smollett's um, history meant that it was also likely to appeal to a transatlantic audience, to a colonial and a British audience. Smollett was a patriot, and so he was not afraid of a full-throated celebration of Britain's imperial con uh, conquest. The first editions of the history um, included this uh, frontispiece, um, which, okay, so this is a classical illusion, but to my, uh, I, I'm ashamed to say, I never got the chance to study Greek and Roman history. So if somebody in the audience knows what this scene is, please tell me, because I'm sure I can, I can do more with it. Um, but this, uh, this is a, a, a first edition of the history, it's open on there actually, um, of the history, not, not the continuation, but this is the first edition of the, of the history of England. And this frontispiece is uh, by uh, Charles uh, Grignon, and it's, it's um, engraved after Francis Heyman. Heyman, of course, was like the, the ultimate patriotic painter in uh, the 1750s and the 1760s. His scenes celebrating Britain's victories in the Seven Years' War were on show at Vauxhall Gardens. Uh, he was part of a, a sort of cadre of patriot painters promoting with Reynolds the British school. Um, so the history was also interspersed with portraits of other uh, inevitably white male worthies. Um, and this was advertised as one of the attractions of, of the book. So the, even so the illustration set it up as being a, a, a patriotic text. But aside from the imagery, um, Smollett's uh, patriotic predilections and his, his deep entanglement, in fact, with empire throughout his whole life, mean that the history also included a good dollop of material on um, Britain's burgeoning empire. And I, I do think this was a source of its popularity, especially in North America. So where Smollett's history overlapped with Hume's chronology, it's, it's clear that Smollett was really sort of going to town on the, on the, on the colonial, the imperial content. Uh, if you look at, for example, Smollett's account of the siege of Jamaica from the Spanish by Cromwell, the early phases of Puritan migration, the founding of Virginia and Pennsylvania and Carolina, Smollett is, is really much more fulsome in his description of these things. Uh, they get a sort of glancing blow in Hume's uh, uh, history, which is very sort of domestic focused. So unsurprisingly, when Smollett got into the 18th century and Britain's Atlantic world grew exponentially in wealth, the amount of imperial content increased too. So in the thick of the Seven Years' War, the third volume of the continuation, for example, included an 11-page account of the Anglo-Cherokee War, including, in a footnote, the full text of documents pertaining to it. Even content not directly related to events in the colonies themselves appealed to a transatlantic audience, I think. So in volume five, a uh, populist member of parliament, John Wilkes, gets a look in. He makes an appearance both as an engraved portrait uh, and in a lively account of his trial for seditious libel, following the appearance of his notorious criticism of George III in the Nor North Britain uh, number 45. Americans on the whole were enormous fans of John Wilkes and his support for the cause of liberty. Uh, Smollett, on the other hand, had beef with Wilkes. I don't have like space to go through, time to go through really all of that right now, but you can ask me afterwards if you want to know more about it. So uh, Smollett's account of the trial is um, suitably scathing. Um, and this is, this is what he said. Mr. Wilkes made a formal speech replete with virulent expressions against the ministry, affected compliments to the person of his majesty and labored encomium, encomiums upon himself as a dauntless champion and persecuted sufferer in the cause of public liberty. Um, 
but so so but he he gave a very fulsome account i was going to make some awful joke there about how americans don't get sarcasm so they might not have got the undertone there but i i just but i threw that out because it's not it's not fair with uh, an educated audience <laughs> but, so never nevertheless uh, you know but this was an extensive account of wilkes and um somebody who the americans cared about a lot so though as well as his succinct pacey and no frill writing style Smollett was not opposed to peppering his writing too with anecdotes and events that had a slightly salacious and, and populist tone to them. So near the beginning of, uh, of volume five of the history of continuation, we get an extensive account of the goings on of the so-called Cock Lane Ghost, which was a purported haunting of lodgings near Smithfield Market in, in London at the time. But even with such diversions as the account of Charles's marriage would suggest, it was a short history, and you can see that from the advertisement too, of course, compared to those of his competitors. And its compactness allowed it to be sold at a cheaper price, making it more accessible. It was amusing, well written to the point, replete with content that appealed to audiences all around Britain and America. I don't think it's really hard to see why it was so popular. And when you put that together with Rivington's transatlantic talents as a public publicist, Smollett's history was equipped to bring tens, um, if not hundreds of thousands of readers together in celebration of an imperial Britain at the height of its powers. And this power, I think, means that it's worth a closer look because it reveals just how tightly connected Britain and its Atlantic empire were at this particular moment. So um, up to this point, you could accuse me of simply highlighting themes that Linda Colley uh, picked out 32 years ago um, in her book, Britain, uh, as being the principal sources of the new British identity. In other words, commerce, Protestantism, empire. Um, I, would, I would first of all counter though that, that Smollett and his history actually reveals a more complex picture than afforded by Colley's important and still relevant work. So first of all, of course, um, Smollett's you know, history reveals that the empire in America wasn't just some external trophy for British people to be experienced at home through proxies of print and, and celebration. It was something that British people like Smollett and Rivington actually lived. Uh, their lives and their fortunes uh, were profoundly entangled with empire and their connections with empire, not just their admiration of it from afar. Um, this is what made it so relevant. Britain was in America, and America was in Britain, and the history shows this in its text, but also in the text, publication, consumption, and reception. But there's something else bubbling under here um, that I want to touch on before I end, something to cloud this happy union of patriots in Britain and its Atlantic world, and it's something Scottish and English. Because it, it's clear, I think, that even at this zenith of enthusiasm for Brit Imperial Britain, there are tensions uh, within the two largest and recently joined nations of this union. It wasn't a seamless union. And the tensions come up elsewhere in Smollett's writing, um, of course, in his first novel, Roderick Random, which was strongly autobiograph autobiographical. Um, and in that the main character is mocked and sort of disadvantaged as a Scot when he arrives in London. But Smollett's history and life together make it clear um, that Scots formed their own networks to make their way in a Britain where the, where the English were, were quite ready to point the finger at so-called North Britons. Uh, they were, these North Britons, participants in Britain and its empire, but that participation was often accompanied by a lingering sense of outsiderness. And this state of affairs comes together in the person of Charles Bell. Uh, Bell wasn't a celebrity of the era. I would be surprised if any of you have heard of him. Um, uh, but nevertheless, he appears on page 236 and 237 of volume two of the continuation. And this may partly have been because he lived with Smollett um, and his wife and daughter, Smollett's wife and daughter, at 16 Lawrence Street in Chelsea, uh, a house where uh, Smollett spent 12 of his 17 years in London. Like Smollett, Bell was a Scot of minor noble extraction. Bell was born in Fife on the opposite side of Scotland to Smollett. Um, and eventually he became the wonderfully titled third laird of Credbury, which is just the most wonderful word. I had to get that in there. So apologize for the fake Scottish accent. Um, his older brother, Andrew, sought his fortune in Jamaica, uh, but succumbed to disease there. So Charles got the, uh, the title of the laird of Credbury. 
And Charles looked to Africa himself for employment, where he served for two stints as the governor of Cape Coast Castle. He didn't marry until he returned to Scotland later in life and Logris Smollett um, during the time of his service in, in Africa. Smollett's history, um, no doubt written with intelligence from his friend and lodger, suggests that Bell was a talented and devoted servant of empire in West Africa. In 1758, whilst on his first stint um, as the governor of Cape Coast Castle, he rallied African allies, according to Smollett, to fend off a threatened invasion of the French fleet under the command of de Kerstin. So like Smollett, Bell was a Scot making his way uh, in service of empire, partly by pulling on connections with fellow Scots. Many of Smollett's correspondence in his surviving letters were Scots, including the very wealthy merchant Richard Oswald, another Scot and a key player in, in David Hancock's book, actually, Citizens of the World, which is about Brit the British Atlantic Mercantile Empire. So there were really very real, real ways in which Scots outside Scotland stuck together and Bell and, and Smollett's relationship kind of exemplified that. Perhaps this was because there was often a threat of being made a scapegoat. Certainly Smollett's description of the fate of Bute, um, the Earl of Bute, let's move on to the Earl of Bute here, um, depicted by Joshua Reynolds in 1773, I think I was told at some point in my education that Butte was loved, thought that he had especially beautiful legs, and so he always had them on show in his pictures. I just thought I'd put that in there for you because they do look very nice here. Um, but perhaps this was uh, because there was often a threat of being made a scapegoat. So, so Smollett's description of the fate of Butte, um, a favourite of George III and a short-lived Tory minister, um, in in the continuation, volume five was shot through, I think, with bitterness about English hatred of Scots. And he, the quote, you know, this is, the character and conduct of the minister might have possibly stood proof against all of those assaults on his, um, you know, on, on what he'd done, applying the side attack. That was, that was Butte's um, main crime, was, was uh, levying a side attack that was massively unpopular. Had not his enemies artfully pointed their arrows at that part of him which was most vulnerable, the Earl of Bute was not only a Stuart by name, but he had the misfortune to be born a native of North Britain. And this very circumstance, we will venture to say, was, in the opinion of the people, more than sufficient to counterbalance all the good qualities which human nature could possess. <laughs> so with this description, Smollett, I think, con conveys the animosity that always lurked, ready to marginalise Scots within Britain. Many Scots embedded themselves in empire, launching careers overseas from London, but they stuck together in the face of English hostility, which remained even as the patriotic idea of an imperial Britain was at its peak. In other words, the history embodied everything that was British and imperial, whilst also incorporating an under, this, this strong undercurrent of British division. Even at the height of empire, it's clear that looking outward together could not mend internal divisions. And this is something that I think Linda Colley missed. Um, in her 2002 preface, to, new preface to, to Britain, Colley seems to suggest that the empire and division within Britain only exists in our contemporary times. As she explains that Britain in the world was once a source of unity, but is now mainly one of, quote, division and disarray. Expanding on her claims, Colley sees in the 21st century a Britain, quote, under pressure from without as well as within and now without the, quote, capacity to function as an efficient umbrella over different peoples and cultures. Spending some time uh, in Smollett's world with his history, I think, makes it clear that it was ever thus, and to imagine otherwise is to succumb to a rather nostalgic view of the past, um, especially with recent scholarship in Britain uh, on Britain and slavery, uh, highlighting here, uh, highlighted here by Bell's springboard for success, the West African slave trade. And that's something that I'd really, you know, I really want to get more into um, as I develop this. Um, so Colley then closes her revised preface with the thought that even if Britain can't be a uniting force, then quote, we should not panic. We should not allow obsessive naval gazing to distract us from evolving a broad angled view of the world and a better and more generous sense of citizenship, end quote. This rather uh, misty-eyed prophecy from 2002 seems a little naive in 2024's Brexit Britain. Uh, perhaps some obsessive navel gazing might actually be a good idea. Being an 18th century historian, I would of course suggest that we begin our navel gazing at the beginning. Uh, at the moment when Britain was forged by the Act of Union, 
And I think Smollett's history is a critical text in such an exploration because it reveals a moment of deep Atlantic connectedness and embeddedness for this new Britain and uh, the very real tensions between England and Scotland that nevertheless endured. Maybe it teaches us that Britain can't rely on looking outwards to create a successful national identity. Um, indeed, the recent turn inwards and away from Europe has once again highlighted that, I think. Let's hope that this difficult period um, in the moment when Britain definitively wrestles, it is the moment when Britain definitively wrestles with these demons that uh, it would appear were always there. Thank you. Okay, the floor is open for questions. And if you are, I should have said at the beginning, but if you're on Zoom and you'd like to ask a question live, just uh, raise your hand, raise your digital hand. Questions? Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Emma. Uh, so talking about the division, what you see under the surface and not so much under the surface between Scots, Scotland and England. But what about America? That wasn't really fun either. And they were people from Scotland and from England who immigrated to America. And why and how was it viewed as American at that time for this discussion? Why did the fracture stop at the Atlantic from the point of view of Scotland? So I, I would say I would say that no, clearly, I mean clearly there were fractures emerging between Americans and, and Britons. Um, the Seven Years War, you know, is, is famously sort of thought of by a lot of people as being the beginning of the end. You know, this is this is when the debt was incurred to uh, that necessitated uh, the Stamp Act um, being brought in. But I, I think that uh, Smollett, Smollett was tapping into a kind of very high level patriotism, which was able to exist because Americans and Britons didn't actually have to live next door to one another. And I think that, you know, they were, there, was, there was enough separation in the Atlantic for these two groups of people to rely on an imagination that they, that they were the same. And that that was easier to carry off than when you actually had to live in the midst of each other. <clears throat> uh, I, I was actually wondering about slightly, something slightly different. Uh -huh. uh, maybe the unified perception of America. Mm -hmm. Because they're okay. immigrants, and they're immigrants from all kinds of countries, and also from Scotland, and also from England. Mm -hmm. uh, but from the point of view of smaller as, as I in the presentation now, mm -hmm. American is new. There is no, the Scottish network stops at the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. uh, or does he talk about the Scottish network? In America? No, I mean, I, I have to go through and look again. That's a good question. Um, I, I will have to, I was, yeah, let me write that down. But he, he is less, you know, he's definitely less, uh, he's not very nuanced in his, in his view of the colonies, I don't think, because this is a history of England, after all, looking outwards. Um, but it, that's a, it, it's definitely worth me going through the history again to see what kinds of, you know, to give the shift in his views of what who Americans are mm -hmm. and his connections with them. His, his, both his publisher and his neighbour, mm -hmm are leaving mm. and are leaving obviously as defined Scotch or mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No. Why, why do they lose that? Yeah, yeah, I I'm, I'm not sure, but I will I will look. <laughs> Thank you. It was a very good question. Yeah. So uh, I founders in their rhetoric they referred a lot to the British history and uh, some uh, professors, especially uh, historians of capitalism and economy, they say uh, they didn't distinguish Englishness and Americanness that much. And 
uh, for example, Franklin and his counterparts uh, here, they were referring to the glorious revolution and they were demanding the rights that were given, right? Mm -hmm. The fight was over English. Yeah. They were demanding that. So how might uh, Somaza's interpretation of history shape their perception of England compared to Hume's and other accessible histories? Mm. That's a, yeah, that's another that's another good question. I've obviously I've neglected to look at things from from the American point of view because I was so focused on Smollett. <laughs> but but yeah, I th I think um, that uh, I could definitely um, follow that up by trying to find out more about the readership of the of the complete history. I think for me the question is. Um, the relevance for because I'm trying to write a biography of Smollett, I've kind of had my Smollett blinkers on. But it's definitely worth me looking at looking at that because it could be a relevance to to him. Did Franklin write about them in the Almanacs or in the Gazette? Uh, there are I I I'm not sure that Franklin actually wrote about Smollett, but he he it's possible. That, I mean, he would he knew someone who knew Smollett. You know, it's it's a small world, so yeah, they would have yeah. Um, Dee, do you want to unmute and ask your question? What? Oh, is she unmuted? Yeah, she's unmuted. I didn't see her. Well, we're not hearing you, Dee. I'm not sure why. Um, I can I can turn mine on. Yours is on. I'm not sure why. Uh, there we go. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. Sorry. I thought I was improving it with the microphone. So anyway, I'm saying that I, I'm really sorry I'm not there, and I um, to talk at length with with Emma, the um, um, a co-author and I are working on a, finishing a book on Thomas Clarkson's Latin essay, and it's all about this kind of intellectual history, and um, and one one of the puzzlements I have, which you don't have to answer. Emma, but is um, uh, Clarkson distinctly moves away from a kind of moral philosophical position in his work to a political economic one, obviously influenced by the Scottish Enlightenment. But there's very little evidence that he actually read in, read uh, Smith and Millar and so forth and so on. So that's a that's a puzzlement that I don't know if you would know anything more about the dissemination of Scottish Enlightenment ideas in Britain, it, because they seem to have sort of been almost like by osmosis or something. I mean, people just seem to know about them. And, uh, um, and he, uh, Clarkson only mentions them quite late in his career, well after he obviously was uh, using their ideas. But my, my question more directly relating to you, it has to do with Scotland, is if, you know, given the uh, patriotic position of Small, et cetera, and Hume uh, about their land of origin, and, uh, and so forth. Why weren't they writing a history of Britain as opposed to a history of England? Why England? That's, that's, that's all I want to ask. Why, why do you, both Hume and Smollett don't say they're writing a history of Britain, which would be logical, wouldn't it? And um, they say they're writing it on England. So I'll leave it at that. I guess, and, yeah. yeah, so thanks for the note about, uh, about Clarkson. And yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I think you know, exploring exploring Smollett's um, you know relationship to these sort of classic Enlightenment thinkers is is something yeah. that I could yeah. I could more of definitely, um, but uh, yeah it's 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 intrigued me and so I my feeling is that it actually might be a purely practical thing rather than any kind of decision of legibility. Um, because so so for a start, David Hume only goes up to 1688, and so a history of England is the right unit of analysis yeah. for him because he doesn't write past 1707. Um, and I think that Smollett probably keeps it that way because it's too confusing to switch to a history of Britain um, halfway through his his volumes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, you know, there's not enough of his 
correspondence that survives that would like give us any detailed insight into his sort of thoughts about the title. Um, but I think he probably kept because later on, um, in fact, Hume and and Smollett's uh, histories were kind of smushed together in a jumbo edition that was sold was sold as a sort of omnibus. <laughs> And I think that sort of shows how Smollett had hoped that they would be sort of seen together. They would be viewed as, as one. And I think just for practical purposes, that's my pure speculation. But if anyone knows anything else, I'd be happy yeah. to. Well, yeah. it, seems, it seems the puzzlement in a way is something you would know otherwise. You'd have to reply to this. But it's just that the rapid switch of, the Scottish, of Scottish intellectuals to a kind of uh, identification with Britain um, with England, rather, there mm, uh, yeah. it, it happens so quickly. You know, you have the rebellion in the 1740s, and all of a sudden, the University of Edinburgh is the intellectual center of Northern Europe. I mean, you know, how did this happen? You know, it's just, uh, it's really striking. So it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, anybody working on this knows a whole lot more than I do. But I, I, um, I've been, I've been very struck by that, but also just this kind of infusion. Of Scottish ideas into English intellectual culture, almost you know, sort of almost as if unspoken in a way. It was so obvious how influential they were and that um, you know you didn't have to say it. Uh, oh, by the way, do you know about Adam Smith? You know, everybody knew about Adam Smith. So that's that's just a, a issue of kind of popular reception that I think, and, and intellectual reception that I think you might you might explore a little more, particularly particularly the place of Scotland in mm -hmm. small worldview, you know, and, uh, um, which I think is more, has been studied about Hume, hasn't it? I'm pretty sure that's fairly clear about Hume. Uh, but yeah, I, no, uh, yeah. And, and so, el that, yeah. Sorry, elsewhere, I mean, the place of, of Scotland in Smollett's worldview is very obvious. And, you, you know, okay. in, in Humphrey Clinker, he, he yeah. idolizes Scotland, and it's clear that he sort of sees it as being um, somewhere that has taken advantage of empire without becoming corrupt like England. It, it's kind of uh, held up as a, a sort of trophy uh, ideal society. So there's definitely, yeah, a lot more to be done with that. Yeah. So thanks well, for flagging hey. that. That's very helpful. Let's go to Jerry yeah, thank you. Jacob, and then we'll go back there. Thank you so much. And I wonder whether we could go back to the two passages of the marriage of Charles II. And, um, Think a little bit about Smollett's use of his sources. Um, and so we, we know that Catherine was celebrated. Though a virtuous princess, she possessed no personal attractions. And then at the, at the very bottom of the Hume, Catherine, princess of virtue, but who was never able to either by graces or a person. Mm -hmm. um, um, where the humor to make herself agreeable to the king. Yeah. So I mean, in today's rather fevered environment, <laughs> not the plagiarism. Oh yeah, yeah, no. So is he? Is he? How how is Smollett using his sources? What is he picking up? Um, have you looked at patterns of verbal plundering? Um, and I mean, this is obviously a, a, a much funnier and zippier. Um, and wittier, right? But you see where he's getting. Oh yeah, from. yeah. So could could you talk a bit more about Smollett and then? Yeah, there is. Human Smollett and the sources. I mean, it, the the advertisement says, you know, he's not finding anything new. He's not going back to any original sources. Right. He's, right. he's just making it much more readable. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a good thing. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, I mean, I think that there is um, an episode in which he is accused of 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 plagiarism at the time in the continuation. Um, and he was, I think he is a, a, a ruthless borrower, to put it uh, kindly. And so I, 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 do, do, I think that your hunch is right, is that he's just, you know, made that funnier and shorter and he's got it straight out of Hume. Um, and uh, I, I think that, um, yeah, I could definitely, I could definitely look more into into how he's executing this as part of the sort of production and commercial process. Because I think what he's engaged in is trying to rise uh, a money maker, because he himself at this time in the late 1750s is is not doing so well financially. The money is not coming through from his uh, 
from the from from his wife's Jamaican estate, namely the enslaved people that she still owns there. Um, and uh, he's been too smart himself. He's been too lavish with his hospitality. Uh, and and I think he is, you know, he's he's bolting stuff together as quickly as possible and putting his own witty gloss on it. Um, and does, does he tip his hat? Does he name his sources in any places? No. no. Well, I mean, he has he has documents. I mean, he has times when he, you know, uh, no, I mean, he has he has times when he sort of includes documents reprinted um, in the in what you know in the footnote field. Not as a footnote specifically, but he he doesn't acknowledge any sort of contemporary sources, um, sort of yeah, intellectual sources. So yeah, and I think this is one of the reasons why he's kind of left on the margins because because he clearly was um, sort of not as serious as some of his other competitors, but he was getting the job done, you know, in terms of making money from from writing. Thank you for this talk. It's as an 18th century, it's great to see Smollett again. Uh, it's kind of fallen out of favor in a lot of ways. And so I think it's important that you're bringing him in here. Um, I have two questions that are rooted in Smollett's biography, so I hope that they'll be helpful for thinking through this project. The first is about Smollett's actual life in Jamaica, right? It's not that he was just married to uh, a Jamaican heiress. He spent four years there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm wondering where that kind of familiarity with an Atlantic circulation might fit into this encyclopedia coming through the Caribbean, and especially on an island that has a sizable Scottish population, especially in the Northwest, of kind of like Green Bones, and <clears throat> has done a lot of work on like tracing that. I don't know if she said anything about Smollett, but that is what I'm thinking about here. And the second one is getting a little bit more at what are the reviews for this text in particular? Smollett is himself an editor of mm -hmm. a review for a year now. This is 1757, right? So mm -hmm. this is, he's very aware. Right, that reviews are a way by which he can generate more publicity for the text and more sales for the text. Um, so is it even reviewed in his own publication, his own periodical? Yeah, great question. No, he. I mean, he he's very um, sort of Caribbean heavy on the content. It's clear that, you know, he maintains that sort of special interest. Um, it's, it's my uh, kind of dearest wish that I find Smollett's kind of lost Jamaican years, that I managed to find more details. Because I think I'm right in saying that there's a couple of years there where people don't really know whether he was in Jamaica or whether he was in Britain. And uh, they don't really have any sources on what he was up to. He kind of disappears for a while. Um, so yeah, so, so I, I, think, I think that that does make him very sort of Caribbean focused. Um, and it's clear that his own experience of, um, you know, I hope to sort of make a lot of this sort of early on in the biography that his experience of going to the Caribbean, um, of all of these Scottish connections that he maintains, he's obviously writing all the time to uh, the Scottish person who is managing the estate of his wife. Um, it's it's obvious that the, the Caribbean is always there um, in his, you know, in the background for him. And it's it sort of makes that that sort of seeps into uh, the, the the history as well for sure, um, and and yet and 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 you know like I mentioned in the the talk um, about Bell being the governor of Cape Coast Castle, and you know Smollett's sort of entire life in and and the orbit of people around him in London is. Uh, there are people with connections to West Africa caught up in this. And in fact, um, I think there is like a, a sort of overlap between this, this Cock Lane ghost episode and two um, uh, Africans who were sent over from Cape Coast Castle to get an education in London um, as, I think, as Methodists and then sent back to West Africa to evangelize. And I, I've got a feeling so I can't trace it directly yet, that both Bell and Smollett were kind of caught up in this somehow. So, you know, I would really love to be able to trace the presence of African people in, you know, Smollett's kind of like physical London world, as well as this sort of presence of the Caribbean and West Africa in, in his writings as well more. Um, and so, yes, uh, the, his uh, history was reviewed in the critical review badly, mm -hmm. of oh. course. Yeah, no, he, he was in a, apparently he was in a foul mood for quite a long time because it got a 
it got a drubbing in the Critical Review and in other places too. Um, I think for it's kind of like plagiaristic tendencies, so they're not being anything anything original in it. But when you're selling sixty two thousand copies a week, mm-hmm. who cares? <laughs> Uh, my question is more about uh, maybe you might be more your question about the search engine, but I'd be interested to think about you know, have you looked at you know um, college co- um, college books being part of university library collections or perhaps in the curriculum because I can recall <coughs> at least anecdotally I've run into Queen's History of England being in library I don't know if I've run it smaller a lot. Mm. I'm wondering if you have a sense of that or if you investigated that or that's what you're doing. Yeah, it's a good question. I can say something while Emma thinks that one of the copies on the table is from our so-called founders collection, which is the early pen library. So that's that this looking. one here. Uh, that's the check. There's uh, also a, a note there that says something fill a library. Yeah. We'd have to figure out exactly when it was acquired in the 18th century, most likely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question, and I, I, you know, it would help. It would definitely help me if I could find out um, what types of libraries Smollett was Smollett's book was in, um, because if it was not in sort of you know the hallowed halls of learning, but was in sort of popular lending libraries, then I think you have your you have an interest. There's an interesting thing there to say about audience. I think. Um, yeah. Hi. Thanks for this talk. Um, this is lively and interesting and engaging. Um, and I'm eager to see what comes out of your um, continued work on Smollett. So I have two questions, but one's really more an uh, opportunity for you to just talk about what you know already and what you might find out. But I just want to go back to the um, Comparison to Hume, because Hume is a kind of salacious bit of insider's office at the end about whether mm-hmm. the princess has the capacity to have children. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's interesting to think that the popularized, the person who's kind of plagiarizing and dumbing it down, doesn't actually include that kind of salacious drama in his very succinct, witty account. So I'm, I'm just curious about that, because that wouldn't have been what I would have expected. But the second thing I want to ask actually vaguely relates to whether um, somebody might have the capacity to reproduce or not, and that is Smollett's claim of surgeon. Um, I'm just wondering an experience, right, uh, in the Navy as a surgeon. And I'm just wondering how that affects his sort of intellectual networks around the Atlantic, um, how he understands, um, to go back to the question about the centrality of Scotland by intellectually by the mid um, uh, 18th century, because certainly in terms of 18th century medicine, Scotland is viewed as kind of luminary um, or Scottish medical uh, tools are. So I'm I'm just curious about that. It seems like he's maybe not a very good surgeon. <laughs> I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. No. Um, so first of all, about yes, him not talking about um, uh the question of children he might actually have that in a subsequent paragraph i'm not sure uh, but i need to i need to check but it, it's it's you know um it's like like you know my desire to to get more uh information about african connections and connections with um slavery um which i don't think i've kind of like been able to highlight so much with with the talk about the, the history. I do I do want to investigate sort of like Smollett's relationship with well, you know the, the women in this as well. I don't want to I don't really want to necessarily just center him in in the biography. And um you know I think there's a way that I can hopefully uh focus some of it on his wife and and his daughter at some point to uh because after all you know his marriage is what kind of sets him up to be able to pursue literature and writing without so i mean he comes back to london with um you know with with 
but when his wife joins him, even he's recently married, his wife joins him, and it's her like income from enslaved people that enables him to kind of set himself up. Um, and so I I think that that this this marriage is is and her sort of like continued contribution. They actually have her mother living with them as well in Chelsea for a long time. So I think there's some really interesting things that I can write about this household. Um, and I'm, you know, one of my sort of hopes is that I can kind of reconstruct this household uh, and its place and kind of get a sense of all of Smollett's, um, of all of the networks around him. Um, but that kind of does actually lead me on to the question of, of him being a surgeon. Uh, so yes, I think he, uh, he trains in Glasgow, he goes down to London, much like Roderick Random, he goes down to London to try and find um, employment in the Navy. And then he gives up after the siege of Cartagena, which is horrible and, you know, I think puts him off. And he tries to set up a practice as a doctor on Downing Street. Um, but he leaves off that after. It's clear that he's absolutely not interested in that and that all he really wants to do is write. And then, of course, he writes Roderick Random and that is enough of a success for him to be able to continue doing that. So I think, I think he's, in terms of, like, you know, the vaunted... Scottish medical knowledge that's definitely something he's on the periphery of he's not one of those sort of vaunted medics of uh, uh, um, he just uses it as a means to an end to get out of Scotland as like the third son of the third son with very little inheritance that's just, it's a means to an end yeah I ask in the description of uh, you he says you know not only was his name Stuart which I assume is like a pretender Yes, right. yeah, yeah, the, the Stuart. But it makes me wonder, what does, what, how does, how does Smollett treat the early Stuart? Like, what's his take? So, as far as he has a take, and it's not just kind of summarizing, but like, what does he do with Scotland in, you know, from 1603 to 16? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I need to, I because I was like obsessed with empire, I need to go back and look at that. But I will, um, uh, I think, um, Go and see what his yeah what his what he what he's like is he scathing towards it's very I think I think I know I did read a bit about Charles I read one of the Charles the first section and he's he's pretty rude about him. He's got kind of wiggish. Yes. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know he was you know. There's that you know in the in the early Jacobean period there's a lot of real virulent anti-Scottish yeah. English writing that's kind of reminiscent yeah. you know of what he's talking about here i just wonder if he knows about any of it or yeah he's kind of aware of this first moment of there's a great migration of scots and then down to london with james who get yeah mocked you know yeah. pretty mercilessly i mean he does he does write uh, he's got, he writes this poem as owed i think the tears of scotland small mm. it does around about the 45 mm. um which brings accusations on him of being a jacobite mm. so he is he's sort of sympathetic to um to the cause the Stuart cause I guess ultimately in that thanks this is this is fun Emmett thank you so much um <clears throat> I'll put out two entirely different paths of questions and okay. you can throw one away or throw them both away um but I feel like I do need to Jim Green is not on but I'll sort of be Jim Green for a minute, because Jim has written about Rivington, um, and so what I'll say is what I've learned from Jim. Um, I love this fascinating connection between the guys, and I am curious what the documentate, documentary evidence is on the English side, um, if any. Uh, Rivington, who you know, clearly had this economic up and down, but he kind of made a huge splash in the colonies. And I think he had three bookshops in mm -hmm. all three cities. Mm -hmm. Susan, he called, called himself, it was the London bookstore. I mean, it was really like the, which, and he was selling books on a scale that nothing like David Hall had ever done. And any of his other, at least in the advertisements, are absolutely kind of exorbitant um, and really interesting. And, and Jim Green talks about this as kind of one of these moments where, you know, the old Jack Green argument of like, the colonies growing culturally closer to London, even as the break is more is coming closer. So this is you know this Londonification that Rivington brings, and it sounds like Smollett is part of his 
a big part of that. And mm -hmm. it's just, it's a weird, I don't know how to turn this into a question, but it's just a weird twist in the sort of empire story. And mm -hmm. it's sort of a small, it is like a big, you know, part of small of the Scott with the history of England is part of the, you know, newly colonial booksellers attempt to be more London like. Make, yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. It's a weird. I think that's what I was trying to get yeah. early on is that you know Rivington can do that because he's at a distance, right? And no one questions mm -hmm. that. Whereas Smollett is some sometimes on the margins of the London literary scene, partly because he's got a sharp tongue sure. and rude to people, but also because he's Scottish, and and that kind of um, you know tension just yeah. doesn't exist in a sort of glorious London representation right, in Boston right. sort of thing. So. I mean, and it certainly would be interesting. I, I know this is not your project, so I don't feel like it to know what Rivington did in terms of importing books and the quantities. And Rivington was doing some fairly innovative things, I think, in terms of bringing books over in sheets and stuff that nobody else was doing and at scale. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a whole kind of market story there mm -hmm. in, in places like Philadelphia and New York and Boston. That that maybe is for your next, you know, when you want to go down that rabbit hole, like, like maybe you'll find some, or if you find more about it in London, I think there are people who need to know. So that's one line. Mm -hmm. The other line is totally different, um, but it sort of follows up on Jerry's thought. When I get the problems of condensation and synthesis and ripping off when you've got David Hume as your starting point, when your book is so popular that you write a continuation, then you have to do the history of your own time mm -hmm. and you don't have you know you don't have the same ability to sort of be mr synthetic uh snippety snap so <laughs> what <laughs> it did sound like it got longer though yeah what, didn't you say it's so the continuation is multi volumes we're only dealing with 20 years I mean, I know. yes i know four yes. volumes yes for, i know yes. for 1800 years because he couldn't condense yeah so yeah. what is the style like is it just prolix is it just like i got a Going on yeah, uh, yeah. I know that's I mean, not easy to answer, but yeah, no. I mean, I think he, I think he, he clearly, um, you know, uh, relies on personal experience more. Like, I, I think the Bell example is a good, you know, he's yeah, getting information there, right? from yeah. people yeah. around him, um, getting to, I guess, intelligence from from people. It's a really different kind of yeah, it is, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I should, you're right. I should kind of, I should probably focus more on sort of when he tosses the the Rubicon from. <laughs> From yeah, old to to sort of almost contemporary to now, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Jessica says, well, now I'm curious if this tracks with the surgeon quote printed for the colony slash American text as the counter sales pitch. So, you mean is she? Is she I'm just reading. Okay, Je Je is Je Jess, are you getting at the idea that that Smollett was actually writing this? Thinking huh. that he could he could make out big time in the colonies, you didn't have to read that. Or that Rivington is thinking that maybe more than Smollett. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, excuse yeah. me. Um, so I give up the, uh, before the continuation. The first one really marks thinking of like uh, reminding me of kind of like you what you know about you know the history for dummies. That kind yes, of yes, yes. yeah, yeah. So that might be think uh, that might be think of uh, about like the history writing style. So I was curious about was this like an anomaly of the time? It was abnormal, and that kind of made me think of like did he influence another one like after him, like yeah. a history a historian that copied his style, like their local style that was in at the time. That um, I mean, I think I think for the most part, people writers sort of before and contemporary and just after him remained fairly more kind of wordy and and longer than him and sort of more highbrow. Because Macaulay, I think, brought out volumes, continued to bring out volumes after um, Smollett Smollett finished, um, and she definitely didn't alter her style. She was aiming at a more lofty audience, I think. Um, so I, I don't think that that no that he I don't think that he necessarily kind of brought out a sea brought about a sea change in 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 history writing. Um, you can't attribute that to him. I don't I don't think he was I don't think he was that you know uh, thinking that intellectually about it as he would have as he would have that. But but it's a good it's a good question. I think I've 
I'd got as far in my research as looking at the kind of histories that came out either side of him, but I think if I went further, especially to when he falls out of favor in the 1830s, that might be a, that would be a useful thing to do. So I could I could sort of look a bit more longer term. Yeah. That's it's interesting point. to think, and even in that advertisement you showed, and I'm sure there's others, kind of what what history is imagined to be. Yeah. yeah. Like, and you can see it's it's right. not. You know, he says, I'm not putting in my own opinion, opinion yeah. so it's not argumentative, right? And <laughs> what it could either be that you find documents, you know, a kind of like detective version of it. Yeah. Or it's just like, this stuff happened and you can just, I don't think he thinks he's plagiarizing. He's like, this is just the stuff that happened and I'm going to retell it in a better way because yeah. it's like a common, it's like a common storehouse of information. Yeah. You just, it's about who's a better writer in that case for him. It's not really a kind of historiographic idea about making a particular claim about the direction of, you know, the, the, the underpinnings of these historical movements. It seems very narrative. I yeah. mean, so you say, I know you weren't going to go there, but it does seem very novelistic, right? Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, I, as far as I can tell, you know, the, 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 the emergence, it's, the emergence of the of the novel and and history writing are kind of pretty. I mean, and in fact, lots of novels in the 18th century right. have the history in their title. So right. uh, there's, you know, they're very they the authors really think that they're doing a similar thing. So if you think about something like Rushworth, mm -hmm. it's a totally different sense of what like Rushworth's collection is like a ton of documents, and then yeah. he's occasionally I think there is a yeah. saying yeah. like we can see this or this. Yeah. This is not that. No, no, and I, I did look at some of those earlier ones, and you're right, it's kind of like a list, it's like a chronicle, yeah. as close as the chronicle, but this is, you, you've moved a step away from the chronicle to... Because it's much more writerly. Yes, chronicle, yeah. Right? There's a narrative voice that's deliberate, that, yes. in a way, that you don't get in chronicle. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. I'm yeah. A, a couple of things, but the description is also that he's writing without disquisition. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not quite sure what disquisitions are, but if you think about They're not good, though. <laughs> Yes, yeah. And so no one's going to mistake these things, but he also says no dissertations. I'm That's not a thing. Right? It's not a dissertation. Yeah, it's not just no disposition. Um, I was also just curious about the weekly installments, yeah. um, which seems like a more about that. great thing to build up enthusiasm. Was do we know whether it was sold in weekly installments in America as well, or was that only? Uh, I don't know. I I don't know. No. Um, yeah, I mean, no. it have to be with a very time lag. I don't, I don't yeah. know anything. The ad implies, he need, the ad suggests he wants to know how many copies to order. It says, tell yeah, me as soon no, as you can, yeah. so I know so how many to order. Yeah. yeah. And he's, he's advertising the a book. Yeah. 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 Okay, so yeah. How does he get connected with Rivington? So I think that, I think they're all in the same, I think Rivington has published something of his before. He didn't publish random, but then he also published, um, I think he published some of uh, his novels in the 1760s. Um, and so, which were not very successful. Well, he published with John Yeah, yeah. And, and so I think he already had a relationship mm -hmm. with him. Um, yeah, no, I just, I was thinking of some of the novels versus some of the other things. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, why did, you know, why certain publishers will publish strangely and not have gone other Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think, and then I think he published, obviously, because, well, Rivington moved to America, yeah. but I think he went on and used a different publisher. I've thought, forgotten who he published um, Humphrey Clinker with. I'll have to check on that. But yeah. Um, because that was it, uh, yeah. That was basically his most successful novel even at the time. But of course, he was dead practically by the time. Then. Johnson. Yeah. All right. Let's take a, a last question. Oh, oh. Uh, this is a, maybe an odd extra, but uh, Britain, England, uh, America. We've talked about all of them. Even West Africa, which I'm happy. Uh, Ireland. <laughs> what about the pirates pirating the pirates? Because that's where the press has picked up. And oh, yes. Reprint, like, do they reprint this? Oh, yeah. Because yeah, that's yeah. often the source for the American market, is yeah. they get double editions. Yeah. Uh, I wonder, is it 
you know, is it actually twice the size of imprint because he's doing one half in London and then Dublin's producing another 60,000. Yeah. Oh, that's a really good point. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Because it's outside the station's company. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and of course, that would be really wonderful for me because it would kind of be even more of an imperial production, wouldn't it? If I, yeah. Okay, no, I'm going to, I don't know that, but I'm going to look, I'm going to look after it. Yeah. I don't know, but it's, yeah. hot, it's probably. Yeah. Her catalog is not turning it up. Plenty of other Dublin. And Ireland. Yeah. Yeah. But not the, not the history. No. Okay. It's a big book. Yeah, that's the thing. It's, it's not a little. Sort of, I'm not sure it works for that pirate thing. It's not a little popular. I mean, it is a, it's a popularizing book, but it's yeah, that's the text is popularizing. The book is still yeah. the same old no, big yeah. desktop yeah. tone, right? So it's an interesting strategy. But then it does come out. I think even yeah, and then book, I think right? it's out in um uh op Octava. Octava. Yeah, pretty quickly. Yeah, there's a smaller version of it pretty quickly. Yeah, because yeah. like yeah. then of course it expands into like eleven volumes as right. soon as you make it into right. yeah. Right. All right, well let's wrap let's wrap up there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.